deep, unexaggerated voice of Loretta Lynn comes to mind whenever I'm driving at night. You may have heard her before, but unless you happen to enjoy country or classic folk music, you probably don't connect the voice to the name. I didn't either until I moved to Cambodia. Surprisingly, there's quite an audience for country music there, and I'd often hear live bands play anything from Don't Come a Drinkin' or The Gambler on a crowded Tuesday night. After some time, I realized that my homesickness could often be treated by a playlist of classic country tunes. The music brought to mind hot summer days and rural imagery, but the voices were what really sold it for me. A soft southern twang and a longing for simpler times. But truthfully, we all seem to know at least a little country music. These are the songs we choose for karaoke when Adele and Whitney Houston are too difficult. These are the ones we sing together on road trips and that seep into the silent scenes of old movies. All of this is to say I very much love country music, just as much as many seem to hate it. And while I will happily queue up the night the lights went out in Georgia or Delta Dawn, I have to admit this is not what most people call when someone mentions country music. See, this right here is a lesson in everyone who says they're your friend, they're not your friend. Because a real friend would have never allowed her to post that video. When they thought this up, they're like, you know what? Let's go to the secluded road. You walk up to the camera, you go, try in a small town. It's going to slay. Her friend would have watched that video with her and said, you know what? Not what we thought it was going to be. Let's delete this. Never talk about it again. But she did it because she's not a real friend. Because she wanted to laugh at her as well. Because she knew she was about to go viral for all the wrong reasons. And she is. Period. After you listen to enough country, you'll begin to unconsciously sort the songs into categories. There are songs about cowboys. To the town of our free road, a stranger one fine day. Hardly spoke to folks around him, didn't have too much to say. No one dared to ask his business, no one dared to make a slip. The stranger there among them had a big iron on his hip, big iron on his hip. It's broken heart. Hey, hey, come here, look at me, hey, look at me, what I say, no, come here, look at me, hey, look at me, what I, no, come here. When the sun goes down on my side of town, that lonesome feeling comes to my door. She is a fantastic talent. These people should shut the fuck up, back the fuck off, and let this woman just shine. Trucks. She flagged me down and climbed up in the cab and said, I never knew you were a pickup man. Beer. There's a tear in my beard, cause I'm crying for you, dear. Family, poverty, love, and heartbreak. Except me. The black sheep of the family. And of course, women. Underneath it all, there's a unique Americana to country music. It is the lyrical lifeblood of the country, originating from folk and from simple songs to pass the time. Part of why many seem to dislike country is not because the genre itself is inherently bad, but because of a classist need to distance oneself from the genre's association with poverty the working class, and a belief that being in those categories makes you lesser. After all, country music is associated heavily with conservatism, which is truthfully common in many Southern and Appalachian communities. It is considered to be lowbrow, redneck, and trailer trash music. Part of this is due to a view of blue-collar labor as less valuable, even though cities rely on the production of food and other items in those communities to function. Although anyone of any race can live in a rural area, often this derision is focused on white people in particular. Sarah Smarsh notes this delineation as being indicative of an often ignored racism and classism, and revealing of the idea of what a proper white person should be. She writes, That term, white working class, was created by a middle and upper middle class culture that needed to somehow distinguish and note that one can be simultaneously white and economically disenfranchised in this country. We didn't walk around self-identifying as the white working class. We were people. 
it's been kind of psychologically distressing to me to see suddenly a fixation and a concern about a people that I know and love as human beings in a way that is only focused on reductive political frameworks. And to have that term become a shorthand for a type of voter or type of person, bigotry even, a certain bent that actually does not represent the people that I know. Similar to how many people will note that they enjoy any music but rap and country, the specific exclusion of country serves as a shorthand to negate any alliance with what country is thought to represent. It serves as what researchers call symbolic racism, which is the disliking of different groups' musical genres as a symbolic exclusion of that group. By stating that one doesn't like that genre, they hope to present themselves as separate from the group that enjoys it. Just as rap is conflated with ghetto-ness, at the other end of the spectrum is country, considered to be the epitome of redneckedness. This view ignores how both genres are reflective of setting. Country music and rap center around different locations, rurality and urbanity. Country is deeply reflective of the locality, often referencing specific places, experiences, and sayings that hold special significance for those who experience them. Many songs reference older ones, in turn building up a lore that is slowly absorbed but not difficult to jump into. It's meant to appeal to a wide but specific audience. The idea that country music is only white ignores that much of the genre is built off of black artists, such as Charlie Pride, Ray Charles, or Leslie Riddle. As noted in A Dive into the Black History of Country Music, giving credit where it's due, the modern-day banjo is a descendant of a West African instrument made from gourds called the Ikanting. When enslaved persons were taken from Africa to America, their instruments came with them. For 400 years, enslaved people created their own music, hymns, spirituals, and field songs, all with roots in African music. Accordingly, in the 1840s, the banjo was seen as an exclusively black instrument. It was unheard of for a white person to play the banjo. In the 1850s, minstrel shows came into raging popularity. These shows were a terribly racist form of satirical entertainment in which white people would dress in blackface to mock black people and black culture. Performing the music and dance of enslaved people, with instruments such as the aforementioned banjo, the shows portrayed African Americans as lazy, stupid, and foolish, stereotypes that originated on the plantation and still linger as overarching prejudices towards black people. Then, somewhat unintentionally, Menstrual shows introduced the banjo to white audiences in a palatable way such that the banjo was quickly appropriated by white people. Thus, the minstrel show laid the groundwork for the rise of hillbilly music roughly around the 1920s. Hillbilly music, which would later be renamed country, became the music of the South. Hillbilly music was not solely centered around the banjo. The first hillbilly artists drew inspiration from slave spirituals, field songs, hymns, and the blues, which itself has black origins. In the 1920s and 30s, despite America being a deeply segregated nation, both black and white hillbilly artists collaborated on a number of popular tracks. According to Patrick Huber, a history professor at Missouri University of Science and Technology, nearly 50 African-American singers and musicians appeared on commercial hillbilly records between those years. Because the music was not a white Agarian tradition, but a fluid phenomenon passed back and forth between the races. After World War I, hillbilly music was officially rebranded as country music and commercialized. Although, admittedly, today there are still few black country artists, and those who do make an entry into the genre are often given a hard time, revealing lingering anxieties about racial mixing and the influence of what may be viewed as other on home turf. Despite being an ill-defined genre, songs such as Lil Nas X, Old Town Road, or Beyonce's Daddy's Lessons have resulted in claims of cultural appropriation and have been denied recognition in the genre, which is an interesting contrast to the rap genre where white people have not been excluded, though they are still less common than black artists. Loretta Lynn's signature song, Coal Miner's Daughter, is considered one of the most influential songs ever made, in part because of the genre and the story it tells of what life was like for an integral part of the American population that is often misrepresented, if noted at all. The Country Music Project describes the song as follows. Coal Miner's Daughter is about as country as music can get. 
The song's theme, instruments, and vocals are country to the core. The theme of the song is Lynn's rural upbringing in Butcher Holler, Kentucky, with seven siblings. She describes her family's experience as a poor but loving unit surviving on a coal miner's pay. We were poor, but we had love. That's the one thing that Daddy made sure of. He shuffled coal to make a poor man's dollar. The song talks about the family with vivid imagery, like the mother reading the Bible by the coal oil light, or the hardships they faced, like the mother's fingers bleeding after scrubbing the clothes clean on the washboard. Lynn discusses poverty and her dad's struggle to even have shoes for all the kids. In the summertime, we didn't have shoes to wear, but in the wintertime, we'd all get a brand new pair. Lynn's main point is that she is proud of where she comes from and the morals her family values. She is not ashamed of her poverty or rural upbringing, but appreciative of her family's hard work ethic, love for each other, and strength in hardships. That is the theme that made this song so popular and also so country. People of similar background felt they could relate to Lynn and her story in a time when the nation was moving towards sophistication and technology. The down-home quality of the song took the listener back to a simplified time of life that held on to important values. Of course, when criticizing country, this is not the song most people are thinking of. In fact, few have issues with what is considered classic country. Artists like Hank Williams, Don Williams, uh, Dolly Parton, George Jones, or even later artists like Hank Williams Jr., Merle Haggard, or Tim McGraw are not typically objected to, in small doses at least. You may even hear a song or two mixed in with pop on certain stations. Newer artists are criticized for a broader range of topics or a narrower one, for changing things up or not changing them up enough. And of course, in these complaints, you note that this sounds like any music schism. Just as any middle-aged parent argues their teenager that the stuff on the radio today isn't real rap, so too will a schism occur in country if it hasn't already, wherein new country and classic country become different genres. However, neither of these complaints touches on a uniting problem throughout the entire genre. Sexism. This isn't solely country's burden. One study which sought to determine sexism across music genres found that rap and hip-hop scored the highest, with rap having 32 accounts of ambivalent sexism and 41 counts of hostile sexism, while hip-hop had 14 counts of benevolent sexism, 26 counts of ambivalent, and 27 of hostile sexism. Country music, on the other hand, scored a 12 of benevolent sexism and 2 in hostile sexism. For reference, rock scored a 0 in all categories, alternative a 2 in benevolent sexism and a 0 in all other categories, and dance a 1 in hostile sexism but a 0 in other categories. As explained by Professor Robert Jackson, benevolent sexism is best thought of as a set of attitudes toward or beliefs about women that categorize them as fair, innocent, caring, pure, and fragile. Rather than being overtly misogynistic, these attitudes are often characterized by a desire to protect and preserve women. In many situations, these attitudes may be casually referred to as chivalry or traditional values. However, despite their seemingly positive characteristics, the attitudes that constitute benevolent sexism are often dangerous and damaging to women's rights and even their safety. Hostile sexism is much more openly misogynistic than benevolent sexism. A hostile sexist is likely to think of women as manipulative, angry, and seeking to control men through seduction. Hostile sexism often views gender equality as an attack on masculinity or traditional values and seeks to suppress movements such as feminism. Hostile sexism often represents a significant danger to women. Country music achieves this through the division of women into two categories, the modest wife and the sexy woman. The modest wife typically pairs with the man archetype, which is far more broad and can range from traditional provider to the lone rogue cowboy, but always remains masculine in the traditional sense. There is no room for him to be anything else. Meanwhile, the modest wife is a good woman. She watches the kids, keeps the house, and waits dutifully for her husband. Luke Bryan's Country Girl, Shake It For Me, or Brantley Gilbert's Bottoms Up, speaks more to the second category, wherein the country girl has hardly any personality other than eye-catching assets, and her main trait is being sexually attractive and receptive. She wears Daisy Dukes and hops in the passenger side without argument. The rise of this archetype also coincided with a transition from major female country singers, where they were once active participants, they now primarily serve as subjects and objects. However, this isn't the only troubling trend. Pacific Standard reports, analyzing the chart-topping country songs from the 1980s to the 2010s, 
Mississippi State University sociologist Braden Leap pinpoints two troubling trends. In recent years, Leap reports, country hits have increasingly depicted women as sexual objects instead of employed equals. In addition, whiteness is celebrated far more often than it was in the 1980s and 1990s, a trend that dovetails with the rise of white identity politics, particularly in the rural areas where the genre is most popular. Contemporary country celebrates heterosexual men in white-collar occupations just like the genre did in the 80s, 90s, and the 2000s. But the ideal rural man is now depicted as a particular type of heterosexual provider, while white women have increasingly been represented as the ideal sexual objects to complement his masculinity. The desire to return to an older time is reflected in these newer songs, which redefine masculinity and heterosexual pairings through short and sexual terms, illustrating the influence of modern-day sensibilities. This goes along with increased references to whiteness in these songs, highlighting an undertone of racial tensions that was far less common but not entirely absent in classic country. Compare, for example, Merle Haggard's I'm a White Boy to Toby Keith's Beer for My Horses. I ain't black and I ain't yellow, just a white boy looking for a place to do my thing. Yeah, I don't want no handout living, don't want any part of anything they're given. I'm proud and white and I've got a song to sing. Well, I've said a few things and I'll admit it. If you want to get ahead, you gotta hump and get it. I'm a white boy looking for a place to do my thing. Haggard's reference to handouts, the song released in 1991, is hard to separate from the iconography of the welfare queens perpetuated by Reagan in the 80s. Meanwhile, Keith writes a flonging about a time when lynching was a solution to crime, and although written to recall Western gunslingers, the inclusion of certain language such as gangsters and of cleaning up a crime-ridden town are reminiscent of right-wing conversation about democratic cities. For example, you got too many gangs doing dirty things. You got too much corruption, too much crime in the street. This time alone, I'm on the ball. Put a few more in the ground. We've got too many gangsters doing dirty deeds, too much corruption and crime in the streets. It's time the long arm of the law put a few more on the ground, send them all to their maker, and he'll settle them down. You can bet he'll set them down. Country music may not be for everyone, but it is for a lot of people. It seeks to be comforting and speaks to the spirit of America especially that which is often hidden away. Often, rural women are ignored in feminist movements which tend to be centralized around cities and surrounding suburbs. It should be noted that women in rural areas often have higher infant mortality because of being farther from hospitals. With Roe v. Wade overturned, many physicians have relocated, creating even greater distances for necessary health care. Even simple needs like health care supplies for periods are often priced much higher due to the distance from distribution centers. Additionally, there are less opportunities for escape via work or schooling, and many rural women find themselves facing the path of housewife or low-wage worker, which is reflected in the music itself. Some may argue that benevolent sexism is a better trade-off than hostile sexism, which is far more common in rap music. But this doesn't excuse rap or elevate it simply due to modernity or popularity. Similarly to country music, rap music flattens women into archetypes, in particular, black women, into hoes and whores, gold diggers, and very, very rarely into good women. Whereas country has always had a major female influence, both in production and performance, rap music has constantly underutilized female talent. One article notes, in a USC Anberg Inclusion Initiative study, Professor Stacy L. Smith analyzed the artists of 700 songs on the Billboard Hot 100 year-end chart over the years 2012 to 2018. Professor Smith uncovered that across all seven years, 12.3% of songwriters were female, 21.7% of the artists were female, and only 2% of producers across 400 songs were female. Most crucially, the producing side of the music industry has consistently lacked female representation. This male-dominated environment hinders women with a passion for music production, preventing them from reaching a high level of success and achieving their career goals. 
Even further, female artists are consistently put in positions of answering the male producers. As producers often have a high degree of creative control over music, these male producers' ideas heavily influence the women's songwriting. Professor Smith's study corroborates this idea, concluding, women are shut out of two crucial creative roles in the music industry. Women are underrepresented and rarely control the strings if they do manage to achieve popularity, as the misogynistic ideas perpetuated in the music are directed at the artist as well. While women in all music genres are held to a higher standard than their male counterparts, females in the rap and hip-hop genres are highly sexualized, suggesting that black women must be willing to play into their own sexualization and objectification, and thus the fulfillment of these stereotypes in order to be successful. Allison Bolden of Chicago University writes, As the focus shifted towards a more sexualized image, some argue that the art of lyricism took a back seat. Critics have begun to claim that the emphasis on sex appeal overshadowed the importance of crafting meaningful and thought-provoking lyrics. While there are still female rappers who prioritize lyricism, it is undeniable that the mainstream music industry has rewarded those who conform to the sexualized image. And truthfully, is anyone surprised? Rap and hip-hop are full of derogatory language towards women with little involvement from women and are asked to participate in their own oppression to gain any success in the field. After all, rich women are paid to model the behavior that lower-class women will copy. They get paid to do it, so we'll do it for free. And crucially, this is all painted as sex-positive and as reclamation. This is despite the fact that songs like WAP don't depict sex or lovemaking, but pornified fucking. The focus is not her pleasure or what she wants. Instead, the entire song sells objectification as empowerment, and it continues in a long-standing tradition of replacing actual sexual liberation with sexual availability. Even by cashing in on objectification, women in rap cannot escape the impact of the sexism and misogyny that permeates the genre. For example, in 2020, Megan Thee Stallion was shot several times in both feet after leaving a Hollywood Hills party with rapper Tori Lanez. Although the incident occurred close to another shooting, the George Floyd shooting, Megan did not receive much support when she did come forward three months later after the incident, nor did she receive support from the rap community as rappers Drake and 21 Savage mentioned her in their joint album with specific lyrics that attempted to discredit her allegations. 50 Cent posted memes mocking her interview with Gail King as well. She warned you, S. No one listened. I'm really scared because I had never been shot at before. I didn't want to move too quick if I take the wrong step. I don't know if he could shoot me and kill me. I look down at my feet and I'm like, oh my God, like I'm really bleeding. Like I can't believe you shot me. <laughs> The police are definitely very much shoot first, ask questions after. What happened? I didn't want to see anybody die, so I just said, I stepped on glass. But this would come back to haunt Meg in a way she could have never expected. There was this narrative going around that she didn't get shot. 50 Cent even posted a very nasty meme. Drake and his new track are suggesting she lied about getting shot by Tory Lanez. This bitch lied about getting shot, but she's still a stallion. Her reluctance to report is likely tied to the belief that black women should support and protect black men, even at the cost of their personal happiness or safety. The misogyny within the rap genre is closely linked to the environment from which it spawned and reflects the beliefs of the urban working class about women. This is frustrating, as the genre itself is political by nature and has touched on many important topics, and yet is difficult to connect to for many women when riddled with vulgarity and misogyny that is far harder to excuse due to its explicitness and violence than that common in other genres of music. As one article in the subject points out, rap music is surrounded by culture, history, and vibrancy, especially within the black community, that has united individuals through the expression of music. Rappers have used their lyrics to discuss world issues, such as Black Lives Matter, mental health, and even the objectification of women. Still, when so many rappers portray women as sexual objects who are overtly attracted to the lavish lifestyles of successful male rappers, they reinforce a dangerous dehumanization of women. The most powerful and influential artists connect with their listeners. 
derogatory lyrics negatively impact how society views women and how women view themselves. These perceptions influence younger generations. Research indicates that an overall desire to be part of a popular group, such as rap music, can override young people's concerns or questions about negative messages. Studies that show that such language stems from a social source that rap music enforces. Moreover, degrading rap music influences younger listeners who are swayed to perceive women in the manner this music presents them. This portrayal has been found to impact how women value themselves and their overall self-esteem. Entertainment in general is hard to separate from coercion. From the very start, the entertainment industry has run on bad labor practices, sexual assault, and a willingness to ignore or hide the realities of the business to keep it well-fed. However, the violence used to describe sexual encounters with women in rap music is easily connected to real-life violence against women. What's your favorite death of a celebrity's career? I'll go first. Do you like teenage girls? When you say teenage, how are we talking? Girls who are teenagers. 19? 19 and younger. I have some 19-year-old friends, but I don't like anybody illegal if that's what we're talking about, underage. Uh -huh. For example, lines such as, Beat that pussy up like Emmett Till. I make her wear nothing but handcuffs and heels. Then I beat it like a cop, Rodney King, baby. If you got a daughter older than 15, I'm a rape her. Put Molly all on her champagne. She ain't even know it. Took her home and I enjoyed that. She ain't even know it. I could go on for ages, but you get the point. It is this environment that let R. Kelly get away with his abuse towards black girls for years. His sex tape was joked about. His relationship with 15-year-old Aaliyah left uncriticized. In 2004, he was actually found to have child porn and got off with a technicality and only a little damage to his career. In the same manner, Chris Brown's career is once again off the ground despite brutally beating Rihanna on camera. Rap is a boys' club which protects the boys. This isn't particularly surprising, except in the obvious correlation between the hostile and violent language used to describe women, the objectification used in videos and imagery, and the normalization of such behavior. Whereas other genres and mediums require some finessing to hide violence against women, rap campaigns it, celebrates it, and mocks victims when they attempt to speak out. This might be where one would ask, why even compare benevolent sexism to hostile sexism? Why pit country and rap against one another when rap appears to be so much worse in its depiction of women? Quite simply, rap and country are echoes of one another. Country is viewed as redneck, white and datedly conservative, while rap is ghetto, black, and all too modern. They both suffer from misogyny and sexism, just on different ends of the spectrum. Older country tended to have female singers and producers, and so offered more variety in its depiction of women, as new country has reflected anxieties about changing times and now reflect modern views on sexuality. Benevolent sexism shifts to regular sexism. In turn, rap music sits at the opposite side and relies heavily on hostile sexism to bolster black masculinity. Country is subtle. It argues for a dynamic that most in its audience has lived through. Rap is anything but. It is explicit in its views about women being lesser and relies on urban identity markers, namely that black women need to protect black men and a normalization of violence and sexism to avoid criticism or change. Instead, liberalism often serves as a balm to soothe any rightful pushback, wherein criticism of rap becomes criticism of blackness itself. In the same vein, conservatism protects country music singers. Subtle doesn't mean less dangerous. Up front doesn't mean better addressed. All it means is, it's not left wing, it's not right wing. It's the whole goddamn bird that hates women. This, dear viewers, is where we part. I have been wanting to do this one for a while because um, I have a country music playlist that is like 25 hours long that I always use when I'm traveling on long flights because I can listen to the whole thing without any repeats. And it's, it's old country, Loretta Lynn, Hank Williams, old stuff. And I really do like it. And it reminds me of home. It reminds me of driving on clear streets with nice sunny weather. It reminds me of going hiking. It reminds me of barbecues and Waffle House and everything that I grew up with. And to be honest, I think a lot of the ballads and a lot of the songs are genuinely just really good music. But then after a while of listening to it, like for hours and hours, you'll notice that thread of like, 
women do this one thing and that's it. Like, there's not a lot of room for different roles for women in country music. And, yeah, there's a little bit of variety. There's the ones where women kill, like, their ex-husbands, which I love. Those are great songs. I love women-led country singers and country bands where they are like, yes, I murdered a man, and that's what I did today. And then I, I see an equal an equal, well, even more people complaining about country because country is viewed as outdated and antiquated. Rap is viewed as a normal, modern genre. And you can't really critique rap because people perceive, like I said, they perceive rap to be black music. And so when you criticize rappers, you criticize hip-hop artists, you're criticizing blackness as a whole, and then you end up in this cycle where no one wants to talk about the elephant in the room and admit that there is a problem at hand. Anyhow, I just thought this was interesting and I'm sure I could go further into detail with other genres, but, the, but when I was looking at that study, it was like the scores were uh, rap had a score of 76, hip-hop had a score of like 72, country had a score of 14, and everything else had a two or lower. And the big gap between those three genres and everything else made me think of all these other connections. And mind you, I wrote this through an all-nighter. I was intending to just write about country and this all just happened to come out. But I think that it really came together well. Anyhow, if you guys have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know in the comment section down below, and I'll see you guys next time.